those five reflections that the Buddha recommends that we reflect on often. In the beginning are pretty depressing. Aging, illness, death, inescapable. But notice the Buddha doesn't leave you there. It goes on to the reflection on karma. Karma is the way out, if we master it. It's important to keep that distinction in mind. Some people think that the Buddha's teachings end with aging, illness, death, inconstancy, stress, not self, give up. They equate that with dispassion. But that's not dispassion, that's depression. You've been hoping for happiness and realize there's no happiness to be found anywhere, and so you give up. That's that kind of attitude would put the mind into severe depression. But the Buddha doesn't leave you there. There is a way out. And it's through our actions, particularly actions of the mind. This is why we meditate. And when we meditate, we focus on the mind. In other religions, they meditate on God or some abstract principle. But here we're meditating on what the mind is doing, because what the mind is doing is going to make all the difference. What you're doing is shaping your experience right now. And if you're not satisfied with what you're experiencing right now, as I say, if you don't like the news, go out and make, make some of your own. If you don't like what your experience is now, you can change it. Look at what you're doing to shape your experience and change that for the better. This is why we meditate. Because the source of all our actions, the source of all our experience is the mind. You've got to look at your mind. The best way to look at it is to get it into the present moment where it's acting. We use the breath because it's our anchor in the present. As long as you're with the breath, you're in the present moment. And then you can watch the mind to see what it's doing to shape the present moment. Use it to settle down, to get the breath comfortable, to get the mind comfortable with the breath. In the beginning, there has to be a fair amount of thought. Think of the image of the bathman or the bathman's apprentice mixing the water with the soap powder to make a soap dough, as they would use in those days. And you have to take care to make it just right, so none of the soap powder is left unmoistened and there's not too much water. In the same way, you get the breath just right, and then you think of ways of spreading that just right feeling throughout the body. Give the place, <coughs> give the mind a good place to stay. And then don't throw it away when you leave the meditation. You've got to take it with you. Because we tend to blame the world outside. There's so many other people around, there's so many other things you have to think about and say and do that we forget our meditation. But remember, those are choices we make. Now we have to overcome some old habits if we want to choose to maintain the sense of well-being inside. But we have to give it importance, because that's what all the Buddha's reflections give importance to, is our actions. And so what are your actions in terms of looking after your mind, maintaining a, at least some sense of being with a comfortable breath, and some sense of having a good center inside, not allowing it to be invaded by other people's energy, not sending your energy out to them. Try to learn to be more self-contained, self-possessed. Your body should be your body and shouldn't be invaded by other people's energies. And you have no business going around invading theirs. So an important part of the practice is not what we're doing here, not only what we're doing here as we have our eyes closed, but also what we're doing as we try to carry that through the day, try to maintain it. If we've dropped it, trying to give rise to it again. And we do that both for a sense of well-being, so that our actions come from a sense of well-being, and also so we can gain some insight into what is it the mind goes for? What are its strange assumptions? 
A problem is that we don't see them as strange, we see them as normal. That is, our habits have become normal for us. An important part of the practice is staying with the breath long enough and with a sense of its usefulness and maintaining a sense of well-being, that you begin to see thoughts that go against it as strange. Then it's easier to let go of them. Stay with the breath. So it's both for a sense of well-being and for insight. Then increasing your mindfulness and alertness to see what it is that you're doing. This covers three of the uses of concentration right there. A pleasant abiding for the purpose of developing mindfulness and alertness, and also gaining the insight that helps us to see our defilements, gain some detachment from them. And as you really get to know the present moment really well, you begin to see how you're putting it together. That is always put together. This is why the present moment is never the goal. It's part of the path. And the fact that you put it together means you can put it together in a better way and you can make a path out of it. And the Buddha's discovery was that you can make a path to the end of suffering. Because we're all on a path of some kind or another already, willy-nilly. All too often, though, we don't know what path we're on. We don't see down to the end of the path. All we see are the things that we like along the path, either on the path itself or on the side of the road, keep us entertained. But the Buddha is warning us, some paths, even though they seem nice, lead to bad places. So you look at your actions, you weigh them against how he defines the different paths that there are. And he said, I'd like to go to the path that takes, to, takes us to the best destination. The happiness that doesn't have to be subject to aging, illness, and death. And it is a happiness. It's not a nothing. There's some strange views out there. I was talking with someone this evening and saying he was at a retreat where everybody was listening to a monk talking about how we're here to arrive at right view, and right view is basically realizing everything is in constant stressful, not self. Therefore, you just accept that and basically give up. He didn't need to say the word give up, but that's what he's saying. And then at the end of all of it, there's, there's nothing. Basically an end of a bad story. But that's not the Buddha taught. As I said, the Buddha was not a defeatist. He said the Eightfold Path is unexcelled victory. It's victory over our unskillful habits. And victory in the search for true happiness. So it's important to keep that in mind. Reflection on aging, illness, and death is to remind us there isn't something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die. And the contemplations of these things, as they motivate you to practice, are meant to get you to the point where you do see the deathless. In other words, you realize that you are shaping the present moment out of the raw materials that come from the past, your past actions. But your shaping of the, these materials actually comes prior to receiving the materials. You already have the skills or lack of skills that are going to determine when you get the raw materials, what you're going to do with them. And so here, as part of the path, we're developing better skills. We're becoming more sensitive to how we fabricate things, fabricate them into a state of concentration, and then we try to keep maintaining that state of concentration. Of course, in doing that, you learn a lot. It's like that book that talks about Army Corps of Engineers trying to keep the Mississippi River in its channel. And over the course of the many years that they've been trying to do this, they've learned a lot about the Mississippi. On the same way with your mind, you should try to keep the mind in concentration while you're sitting here and as you go through the day, you'll learn an awful lot about the mind. In particular, you see the extent to which you are 
shaping your experience and how you can do it in a better way. And ultimately you get to the point where the mind doesn't fabricate anything. Its sensitivity gets greater and greater to realize that any kind of fabrication, even skillful fabrication, has stress. It's inconstant. So you ask, why do I keep engaging in this? And when your sensitivity is developed properly, then you can see that there is an escape. The fact that your fabrication comes prior to the input from the senses means that when that fabrication ends, what you find is something that's outside of the senses, outside of time, outside of space. And that's what I said. It is the ultimate happiness, the ultimate well-being, bliss, or to, however you want to translate the word sukha. And it is a state of knowing. There is an awareness there. You're not blanking out. You're not going to nothingness. And it's a happiness that doesn't change because it's not fabricated. So this is what that fifth reflection leads to. On the one hand, we have all the other things that we might go for, and one of the reasons the Buddha has you look at the, the drawbacks of all of our regular pleasures is that if you satisfy yourself with those pleasures, you're not going to be looking for anything better. You have to see that they have their drawbacks. You want something better. And you do it, you find it through your own actions, becoming sensitive to your own actions as you learn to become more and more skillful in what you do, say and think. So when you can create, through your actions, a good state of mind, be careful to maintain it. John Fuang had some students who were complaining one time. They'd been meditating with him, and they got in a really nice state of meditation. Then they went back home. They started talking with some friends. And they found that as they were gossiping about other people, that, that great state of meditation, the great state of mind they had just dissipated, dis disappeared. So they went back to complain to John Fuang, why is it that they couldn't maintain it? And he said, well, you took gold and you exchanged it for shit. Pretty blunt, but it gets the message across. Your ability to maintain a good state of mind really is gold. Make that your gold standard. As you go through the day, you want to maintain the sense of well-being in the body, maintain the sense of well-being in the mind. So you have a better and better foundation for acting in skillful ways, and a better foundation for seeing the subtle things that the mind does that can destroy its happiness. And you don't blame it on situations outside. You say, this is my choice. I'm just being mindless, not alert. But mindfulness and alertness are qualities that I can develop. Remind yourself of that again and again. There's so many things in the world where the effort you put into it doesn't really give you many results, but that's not the case with the Buddha's path. All your efforts on the path are well rewarded. 